psychedelics, drugs, or potential tools to explore the mind? What motivates the researchers in this field? Psychedelics, why and how? Sasha Shugin, some call him the father of MDMA, but in fact he is one of the leading researchers in entheogens, in chemicals that change our mood, our brain. Now, what I'm interested in, uh, Sasha, is the roots of this all. I mean, you started working this as a scientist in a laboratory with modern means, but doesn't all this searching for the alternative goes back many, many, many centuries? Well, you have to realize what I'm searching for, which is not for altering consciousness or for having fun or for enjoying this or for discovering that. I'm looking for tools that can be used for studying the mind. And other people then will use the tools in finding out the aspects of the mental process and how it ties to the brain. But my main drive is in as a, as a tool maker, making of tools and letting other people exploit them. What, but that means you have a fascination with, with how the mind, how the brain works. Complete, completely fascinated. But not the brain, the mind. The brain is now, the, we're in the decade of the brain. Everyone looking at neurotransmitters here and serotonin and dopamine and all these sort of things, which is a marvelous search. And indeed, they're uncovering many peculiarities of neurological connections. But many are being found in animals. And in fact, the animal is the main uh, location for search, for research. And I'm interested in things that affect the mental process, the function of the mind, which is not necessarily to be found in an animal. So the questions I am addressing are how does one affect the attitude towards something, the self-image of something, mm -hmm. the feeling of, 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 of religious ecstasy or of fear and paranoia, something you can't see in a rat. Is that true? Do you think that that's the difference between human beings and, and animals? That I, I cannot conceive of how a rat would have a good self-image or a bad self-image. I might see how he behaves to a stimulus, or how he might retreat from an attack, or how he might be lured by some pheromone into some uh, re relationship. But a self-image, uh, the uh, knowledge that he is mortal and he must achieve something or other before his death, uh, the sense that he has a, an ominous uh, apprehension of something that might occur in the future, uh, the memory of an early life experience, uh, earlier incarnation, reincarnation. These are interesting aspects of the human mind, but they're not, that, to my knowledge, knowledge of uh, a part of the rats. In, well, long time ago there was St. Francis uh, in Italy, and he, I, was, I liked that, he went out and preached to the animals and the birds, so there must be something. <laughs> well, maybe uh, he enjoyed that form of uh, interaction. I, did the birds respond well? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> there is no order of, of, the, of the birds yet. Yeah, no. yeah. But there is a St. Francis. There is a St. Francis, <laughs> and, and then he changed things. San Francisco, for one thing. Um, can, you, can you, when you go back to when you were young, what, what, was there something that made you go for the mind? Yes, uh, it was um, an extraordinary experience with mescaline. Oh, gosh, about 40, maybe 40 years ago. I was given in an experimental setting uh, 350 milligrams of mescaline sulfate. And I knew intellectually what it was and what it did, but I did not know personally what it was and what it did. There were about 10 of us together, and about half of us were experimental subjects, and half of, of the people were babysitters. And I went in it with an, rather an open view of what was going to happen, and I was totally dumbfounded by what occurred. I suddenly found myself into an extraordinary world physical world around me, visual, sensory world of color, of interpretation, of motion, of form, of shape. And I, my first response was to say, how did this drug do this? How did 350 milligrams of a white solid produce this effect? And then I realized the drug had almost nothing to do with it. That drug allowed me to realize, express, to, to appreciate what was there all along. And I was totally blind to it. So what it did, it catalyzed the opening 
of my own viewing, and that caught my fancy. And from that point on, I've, I've been in research in this world ever since. <laughs> yeah, but go further back, because the fact that you were even willing to do an experiment like that must have had earlier roots. I mean, was, how was your, your, your parents? Were they obsessed with the mind? Was there a school that said, hey, this is... No, the um, I think probably immediately prior to this experiment, I had been exploring psycho hyphen this that changes. I had been reading everything I could upon things that were sedatives that were narcotics, uh, everything from vasodilators of yohimbine, which might be uh, as uh, uh, aphrodisiacs, to the psychedelic drugs. And the word psychedelic did not exist, but to drugs that might be involved in changing the point of view or attitude of people, things that might be in uh, with some religious context. I was intellectually preparing myself for this event. Why was I interested at all? That would go back yet younger uh, when I was in my pre pre-adolescence, in which I found myself in a very interesting interaction with some kind of an alter me, an alter ego. Uh, I had uh, a very few, very few, in fact, I had virtually no good friends. A few I had were either aggressive or destructive. Mm -hmm. And so I was more or less a loner. And I got deeply involved in music. I found that good retreat in that. But being in music uh, alienated me with yet other people who were in the physical world and sports and what have you. And so I more or less pursued my own relationships with my own unconscious. And I did not realize at that time that that was a, a potential ally. And I saw it as a, as a, as a not a particularly friendly component. Could you, if you say that, could it be that you were searching for the dark depths of your mind because the fact that other people didn't like you, you were a little bit of a loner, that that, that, that made you s doubt yourself and that these substances and this research gave you an opportunity to look deeper into yourself? Well, I did not know at that time that there was any research or any world like this out there. I had to live totally within myself. I remember uh, the, the pleasures I had in being underneath a, a fence. Uh, that was behind the house. I lived in Berkeley at that time in California. And the fence was a honeysuckle fence. And on it were these marvelous little blossoms that you could bite the end off and, and have a very sweet drop of fluid. And I found that was an ally in the sense that here was something that made me feel at home. And yet my neighbor and my parents owned the fence, but the path underneath it went on both sides. And I could, in essence, uh, straddle across both worlds. <laughs> In a, uh, and use the. You still do that, huh? Still do that, yeah. But you use the honeysuckle as sort of a, as a personal, uh, palliative retreat, and it was a personal friend of mine, and uh, I established a good relationship with that plant, and maybe that was the beginning of a relationship with plant and plant materials, just the sweetness and the and the absolute trustworthiness of honeysuckle. Yeah. But so your mot motivations might not have been to seek the Godhead at first? You were just curious? You wanted to know why you were different and how that worked? I don't think I'm interested in the Godhead now. I don't quite know what it is. I'm interested now in what works upstairs and why it works. Sometimes you have to disrupt something to see how it should work. Sometimes you come across something that is disrupted, and these may be tools to reconstruct what has been disrupted for pathological or, or traumatic reasons. I don't know. But you have you can go into the direction of, of trying to repair, help, be a therapist, interact with others. This is noble. This is a whole profession unto itself, not mine. What I know in time there will be a going with tools, with therapeutic tools to the helping of others. And my art's making those tools. And I want to use my energy that way. Now, some people will say that the tools you made, 2CB and, and you re brought to the surface uh, MDMA and many, many other uh, substances backfired. It, it has been used for the wrong reasons. So you, they see you as a bad guy because you, you didn't help the world, you put it into more misery. In what, I, have no, no, I have no voice in how these things are used. Mm -hmm. My point is putting them in the medical literature, the scientific literature, and let people use it. Good heavens, people publish how to make gunpowder gun and isolate uranium isotopes. Mm -hmm. That makes it no less of a of a search, how these things are, what they will do, how, and, and how, how to obtain them for whatever use you wish to put them to. Education can be put to a terrible misuse. I've seen it done that way. Mm -hmm. uh, someone will ask me, well, aren't there irreversible changes from drug use? There are irreversible changes from an advanced degree in the university. You're never the same person. But you've been equipped with something. How you use it, then you for, sort of strike a bargain with your own alter ego and perhaps your own unconscious. But to have that information allows you to use it. Not to have it robs you of that possibility.
And I struck tools exactly at that point. They're there. They do this. They modify that. They change the viewing towards something. Search it out. Let other people use the tools, and they are far better equipped than I am to use them. I have, I have no experience, nor do I particularly want to use it that way. But I want to make the tools because I can, that I can do. <laughs> yeah, but you personally, have you felt that it, that it worked, that these things helped at least yourself and the people that you knew good enough to get a, another view on reality, to, to see themselves in a, in a... They've helped me very much. Uh, my my wife uh, very much has a, a good uh, viewing of what she calls the shadow, the aspect of a person uh, who is confronted, will, in fact will not confront, but has there to confront an inner something, a beast, a, a shadow, a something of the person, the in Jungian sense, the unconscious of that, not the subconscious, but wait down there at the beast in the belly. And that is very often looked upon by people as an absolutely frightening uh, enemy. And hence it is suppressed, it's turned away, maybe we can turn to do this, we'll escape, we'll go and work at a living over there, or we'll drink too much over there, or maybe we'll marry as we shouldn't marry, but have children. Escape that, it. Escape, absolutely. Rather than confront that, and to f confront that is frightening, and to some people it could be very destructive. Take a person who knows that beast is there. Mm -hmm. yeah, a, but, but for you, was it destructive? For it you? was the most marvelous thing that could happen, because I found it's a damn ally. I could use it or not use it as I chose, and we, we in essence, shook hands. And was that an extra drive for you to go further in the world and, and look for other things because you think it worked for you? This is a use of a tool that worked for me, but it's not the type of tool I'm trying to develop. I'm trying to develop tools that interfere with the more subtle aspects of the intellect because there are many cases where this could be a therapeutic or a constructive or a beneficial approach in areas of mental illness, in areas of, of incomplete cognitive control, in areas of, of, of tumor or traumatic damage, to find alternate routes, alternate routes to, to uh, integrity. Well, there's two models there. One is the, of the disorder model and the other is the augmentation model. The disorder, uh, aug augmentation, um, the disorder model is someone is sick, has a problem, has a, a you know, a psychological, even a bodily function that doesn't work, and with your inventions, uh, substances that might help, mm -hmm. bringing back to the baseline. The other thing is to help people to become smarter. Let's, mm -hmm. You know, we, we can talk about smart drugs or, or substances that might give them an advantage in the world. Mm -hmm. Now take people that take a SET test. I think you call it yeah. in America yeah. all these, these t yeah. tests. If he takes certain drugs, he might be able to do to make a better result. Is that true? It may well be, but that is not of any interest to me. Uh, to me, either the the repairing of what is deficient or the augmentation of what is adequate are interesting uses of these. But I'm not. This is not of interest to me. Uh, if something is inadequate, repair might come from a number of the sources. I don't think necessarily the understanding of the of the mechanism of the mental process will lead to automatic repair of damage or augmentation of adequacy. It will allow a tool to be used to explore why it is deficient or explore how it might be augmented. Do, I don't really believe augmentation is that difficult a task. I think that we're, we're running at a full 3% of our capability right now. And I think with just a little bit of, of uh, self-discipline or perhaps a little bit of faith, in, in oneself, you could go from three to four percent. That's a big increase. It doesn't, it doesn't take a drug at all. <laughs> no, you can you can you can eat better food or go take better holidays. Work it. It's many ways. Um, but still, there there's the feeling that that these things we can do to ourselves have an ethical side. If if people who are rich can use them and others cannot, what would happen to the to those who stay behind? How is a rich person can use something that a poor person can't? I don't understand. Well, uh, suppose that there are drugs available or, or medications or, or substances that help you to become smarter. All right. Say there are. Uh, is this in the interest of the people who control the availability of drugs to have people become smarter? Is this really the power structure within our government to have people become more informed voters? Is it uh, in, in the interest of, of politicians to have people more intelligent? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? I don't think that that's quite real. I think it's the interest of those in power to maintain that power. And one way that power is maintained is to restrict and deny and eventually eliminate drugs that would, con that would constitute competition. Yeah, but then there's always revolutionaries like you alchemists who go 
seek nature, seek seek science, seek a way first to to help themselves to 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 do the internal alchemical work, but then it goes out in the world, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. True, but I don't believe, other than the satisfaction of getting this information into the public, that I'm a power seeker. Because I find that that is a trap, I've seen it in other people, a trap that allows people to actually begin compromising their own principles very cleanly and very neatly for the sake of accruing power, wealth. It's the same same thing. Uh, I think that the, the satisfaction is what lives beyond you. And indeed, that's why we have children, that's why we have families, that's why we establish relationships, and that's why some people paint art, some people write poetry, and some people make chemicals. Mm-hmm. It's a way of leaving something that is lasting and may be of value. Otherwise, with your death, you're, you're, you're a, a flame that's gone out, nothing else. Last night I dreamed, and there was this word, the being of time, which you can interpret in many ways, the being of time, of We we happen to be in Mexico at the, at the moment. The Maya people who lived around here were obsessed by by mm-hmm. by things like death and time. Were they also obsessed with with the the, the substances we're talking about? They uh, they have survived in many ways. One of my favorite questions I get asked when I come back from the southern part of Mexico is, "Where have the Mayans gone?" And the question is, you answer it. You just go there and look, and they're all about you. They have indeed survived. They have survived most eloquently. I don't know where the Spaniards went, but the Mayans are still here. So in that level, they have they have achieved, a, 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 a tra- at least a, a, for the moment, immortality. Have they used materials such as this? Of course they have, because they are all the time searching into themselves for exactly the answer to these things. These are the tools that I have used in some ways as guides as how to design new, ma- new, new materials for research. But uh, rather, you went to look what, say, the, uh, the, the 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 botanical stuff was out here, and and used it to see what chemicals were active in there. Completely. Here is a plant. This plant can be used for this purpose. The plant can be used for healing. The whole process of healing is a beautiful example. Here you have drugs, chemicals that are healing chemicals. They are in plants. The the ancient knowledge, wisdom of what the plants are is indeed carried from generation to generation, but a little touch. Sometimes the healing plants are used to treat illness, not in the patient, but in the physician. The physician will take the drug, will take the healing thing to be able to interpret what is wrong with the patient and be able to help the patient. A different view that comes only with the awareness that healing is a process, if you are a healer, of interaction. And that but in- that's so funny because you have studied the chemical interaction, which is very defined, we talk about uh, molecules and their their active parts and what you call the dirty pictures of the of the chemist. And now you say yes, but there is another thing. There's the interaction that the doctor can be the helper, but also he can be the one who takes the burden because that's what they do. Leap ahead to the purpose I'm after, where you develop tools that can be used in studying the human mind. The person it, that will require human human interaction too. And that whether the tool is used in a radioactive sample to go into the brain and go into a positron emission tomography picture to see where it goes doesn't tell you how the mind works. It tells you where the chemical goes in the mind. To understand how the mind works may take the interaction with the subject, the volunteer. It may be the researcher. It may be both. But it may be uh, an exchange of understanding in which these chemicals merely open up doors, catalyze vehicles of expression that would not otherwise be there. These are not going to be doing things. They're going to be allowing things. Just as the plant to the medicine man in the jungle is allowed to see the, the definition of the illness, this is a way in which a researcher or a person who is a companion in a question is allowed to see the approach to mental process. It doesn't do things, it allows things. And that is the heart of this whole area of research. Your next book is... We have a book called Pical, and now there's going to be a book called Tikal, which is about a different class of, of chemicals. It's uh, the area of these mental catalytic, uh, so-called psychedelic or psychoactive materials. Pical is for phenethylamines, which is about half of the psychedelic scene. The other book is about tryptamines, which is, in essence, the other side of the coin. It's the rest of the, of the picture. The two members of these two classes probably constitute about 95% of all psychoactive drugs. Now, in the first book, there was a very personal account of your coming to terms with these mm-hmm. things. It was more of an ad- adventure on how you invented these things or invented, found them. 
Is Tikal going to have that personal aspect too? It'll have personal aspect, of, but uh, both Anne and I have covered this question already of how we got started, how we are at peace with this, and how we have formed our own relationship. Now, what have we done with it? Where have we been going with it, and where might we go with it? So that aspect will be kind of a fictionalized autobiography as well. And then the second half of the book, again, will be as in the first book, uh, descriptions of the drugs involved. For the people that really want to know, what I think people really want to know, are you happy? Because you, you what, what's your age now? Uh, 71. You fly around the world, speak at all kinds of conferences, do work, you're still in the laboratory, you've had some problems with the law there, that you, they didn't allow you to do some research, but you're still very active. Mm -hmm. this, this, all this work has done you good? I could not be happier. Thank you, Sasha. There are chemicals that are pheromones to insects, which come from plants. That the pheromone, for example, if it comes from a plant that was blooms too early in the day, is the wrong optical isomer, it will turn away the mating path of the other insect. But the insect will then come at the right time of day to pick up the pollen at the right time to take the other. <laughs> Chemistry, weird, weird, yeah, weird pheromones. I mean. Weird this, and without one, you don't have the other. This interview took place in Palenque, in the Mexican state of Chiapas, and a place where magic mushrooms can be found in the fields. But the same goes for many places in Mexico, and in the old days there was probably a cult around magic mushrooms or other psychedelic substances. Sasha Shulgin is probably the most renowned expert in the world on Synthetic drugs. Chemical compounds that have effects that resemble those of the magic mushrooms or other substances from the past. Like the ergot or some substances that people think that the Aztecs used in their time a few thousand years ago. Sasha Shugan researched most into psychedelic drugs. He was interested in tryptamines, amphetamines, and has written two books. One of them is called Pical, the people who are interested in phenylamphetamines, and his latest book is called Tikal, and it's about tryptamines. Tryptamines like DMT, one of the substances in magic mushrooms, or psilocybin. But DMT comes back in many, many substances from the jungle, like the ayahuasca from South America. Alexander Shugin and his wife have done chemical research, but also therapy, group therapy, individual sessions with many, many people based on the substances that they have found. And as Alexander Shugin has said, he has used all the compounds that he found, invented, made. A truly remarkable man who can be seen as the father of ecstasy, although that's the one chemical compound he hasn't actually synthesized first. But he made many, many others, like 2CB, PCP, and many, many of these so-called designer drugs, synthetic drugs, as they're known. The drugs of the disco scene, although that is certainly not what Alexander Shugin intended. He made those drugs, he researched into strange substances, strange combinations, strange compounds, in order to know more about the mind. Of money in the United States. It is a political interesting point of view of the military in Mexico, as almost all the marijuana is raised by the army. 
and that is their direct feedback. That's how they get there. It's, isn't that crazy? I mean, t by the way, do you think that what the, the Dennis Perron is doing now in, in San Francisco, is, is he going to succeed or will they find a way to, to curb the whole thing? I think eventually they'll find a way to stop it. Because it is not in national interest. It's not in the, in, the, uh, in the interest of the economy and the war. I have one chapter in the book is called Qui Bono? To whose benefit is this war on drugs? And in there I address in, this, in, that, in that country, in the United States, what is the size of the industry that is the war on drugs? Not how much money is involved. Uh, on the both si sides, I mean, both yeah, the, the, the criminal side industry, and the police and the... As an industry, how big is that industry? <laughs> Prisons and the fastest yeah, growing, yes. Yeah. It's, it's an enormous business, yeah. It's probably between three and five hundred billion dollars. So there's no reason to stop it. Who benefits by stopping it? Mm. These people lose their contracting, the police lose their what's it, the uh, State Department can no longer enter Spain with a little muscle and do this and do that. No. Yeah, Dennis Perron said that, uh, you know, the effect of his work would be that the price of marijuana would go down. And I thought, Jesus, that is maybe the, not the wisest <laughs> thing to say because, yeah, mm -hmm. que bono, who has an interest in lowering no. the price of marijuana? There's such a... I mean, Dick, Dixie cups make cups routinely to sell for urine tests. Eight. If Hewitt Packard is back ordered on GCMSs at fifty thousand dollars a piece, providing these instruments for people who want to confirm urine tests of people who want to work for the gas company but can't work for the gas company unless they pee in a cup every three weeks. This is a big business. Who benefits by wiping out the Constitution, which has been about thirty percent stripped of its meaning because of the war on drugs? It used to be you were secure in your house. You may now be entered by a policeman who's acting in good faith. And I yet to see a policeman who doesn't act in good faith without a warrant. If in good faith he thinks there may be a drug crime committed. And you have salt on your kitchen table, that is part of... If in good faith he believes there is some crime associated with your car, he may take your car without even arresting or bringing a charge. Your car is gone. And he keeps it without accounting. There's no now, auditing. Now, now there was the feeling that, you know, a nation always needs a warrant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we had a war on drugs and there was the hope that there, that there would be, or the hope, there was the idea that there would be a thing called uh, the war on uh, cyberspace. Yeah, the electronic mm -hmm. frontier, mm -hmm. the electronic hypeway, mm -hmm. I think Max Moore called it. Uh, now, they're finding out it doesn't work. People mm -hmm. don't want this new, this mm -hmm. new expansion. Would that revert to the war on drugs? Would they go back with the government, instead of spending money now on the electronic highway, go back to, to fighting drugs? They've never left fighting drugs. That's, that's not well, that's people say that under Clinton there was a little bit of a, of, of a, less, of a less of a of a thing. Oh, I missed it. Yes, you yeah. think it, it, it went on as this strong is as before? This is the only election I know of in which a Republican ran against a Republican. <laughs> No, tell me. Clinton to win as the uh, thing. He says every teenager, we're going to have this McCafferty figure a way we can get this into law and so forth. Every teenager who applies for a driving license shall take a drug test. My question is, and if he fails, you can deny him the license. But three out of every hundred tests are false positives. Are uh, you going to deny three? out of every hundred teenagers a driver's license because your tests are mediocre? What are you going to do with the people who fail? Tell them to come back in six months? They never answer these questions. Everybody, if you get a little spot test and you're positive in a year, of course you realize that morphine has now been shown to be a natural component of the brain, besides oh, bagels giving you opium poppies things. <laughs> uh, you drive down on a bus in the back of a bus in, in going from here over to uh, Via Hermosa, and that pot smoking back makes you positive urine, marijuana for the next three days. Uh, that's not of your doing, but you're positive. And three out of every hundred are false anyway. You're, you're condemning why, hundreds why, of thousands Why are of people. making people this, this nearly fascist, frightening society? Because it's not good it for our control. health. No, it's not good for our health. It's not good for the constitutional right because it is a control. What, why do people form police states? I lost the, the thread. Why were the national movements in Germany in the third, late 30s what they were to cleanse and make the society clean and uh, homogeneous and uh, lead to the Fourth Reich and the better, better state? Why? Because jolly people got their jollies out of it. They were in power and they could run it. 
And say we have exactly the same thing in the United States. We have whole bodies of elite who are really doing a lot of controlling. They're not elected and they're not even known publicly. You have the General Service Administration. You have hosts of advisors into the military and in the, in the executive who are not publicly known figures. Why is it that the pollution that is outside in the world and that we know has also really invaded our political system then? When was it we're free of it? The, the, the pollution. I know, but, but we were never free of it. We've always had a form of pollution in the real in the in, in the real world, world and in the in, yeah. in, in the virtual mm -hmm. world yeah. Yeah. yeah that is the way of politics the way of the warriors in the other sense <laughs> not a nice way <laughs>